And then I got scared. Whoa! Is that me or is that uh, something else? And Dave, if you don't mind, I'm a little... Whoa! Is it me? It's probably me. My wife says it's me. So it is probably me. The whole thing? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh-oh. It's a hot mic. I'm a little wired here. Oh, sorry. Pardon us, folks. We'll just go ahead and uh, do this while you stand and watch. And <laughs> That's all right. All right. So let me, am I on now? All right. Well, after that awkward little start, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll get things figured out here just a little bit. Well, guess what? What's today's date? Anybody know? Twenty sec. You know what today is? You know what it is? This begins fall. My favorite time of year. You know what fall means? Fall, in my mind, fall means sitting around a fire, sitting around a bonfire, sitting around a campfire. One of my favorite authors who recently passed away this year wrote, poking at a campfire with a stick is one of life's great satisfactions. Anybody else get satisfaction out of sitting around? Now, unless, there's a caveat, unless... My wife is the one with the stick. Because if my wife is the one with the stick, you can guarantee you're going home with holes in your clothes. Because she will poke at that fire and send ashes and embers and flames into your lap and all over your clothing so that when you go home, you will be riddled with holes and it looks like you took shrapnel or something when you went home. But that's just the way it works. You know, but fire is one, sitting around the fire is one of my favorite places on earth. There's an old story written by Jack London. If you remember the author of Jack London, Call of the Wild and such stories, he had a short story called To Build a Fire. And it's the story of a man who goes out in the bitter, freezing, cold wilderness. And it is so cold and it is so wet that no matter how hard he tries, he cannot get a fire started. And so, in the end, he perishes. A number of years ago, I was on a, a solo hike on the Appalachian Trail. And I had hiked all day in a soaking rain. And at the end of the day, I was completely wet. I have all the proper gear But no matter what, when you spend an entire day in the rain, I don't care if you've got all the right gear or not, you are completely soaked to the bone. And I didn't realize, this was a hike in the fall, I didn't realize until later upon reflection how close I had come to approaching hypothermia. You know, throughout human history, fire has always been viewed as one of the essential elements of life. It provides, think about it, before days of electricity and our modern conveniences, fire was dependent upon for warmth. Fire was dependent upon to cook your food over. Fire was dependent upon, if you put fire on the end of a stick, it became your your light, right? I mean, so, so light, warmth, food, you name it, fire was at the beginning of it all. And metaphorically speaking, our sto- souls, our souls still need a fire to live. Because think about it. Without it, we become dark. We become cold And we begin to starve without a fire that burns within our souls. And so our series over these few weeks as we look at the first five chapters of the book of Revelation is about cultivating that fire. To build a fire we're going to talk about this morning because without that fire we will grow cold. We will starve the life out of our souls. And we will and have a propensity toward 
darkness. You know, there's three basic elements for fire. Who knows? What are they? What are the three basic elements to have fire? You've got to have what? A source of heat. You've got to have what? Fuel. There's got to be something that is consumed or burnable. And one other, you must have oxygen. Similarly, in the passage that we're going to read this morning, there are three things. There are three things that our souls must have. Must have to keep our souls alive and burning and warm and fueled. The reality is life can be hard. Right? I mean, we, we start this book, when we, when, when we talk about the Bible, we start this book in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and we read, life is good. We come to the end of the story in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, and we read, life is good. But guess what? There's something happens right after Genesis 1 and 2 that takes us all the way up through you know, Revelation 20, and that stuff in the middle is where we live. And that stuff in the middle where we live, we basically look at the world that we live in, and we, we often can say, and if we're honest, we have to say, you know, life's hard. We have to make hard choices. We have to do hard things. We have to speak hard truth sometimes. Uh, we, we have to do things that maybe are uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes we face difficulties in life that, frankly, it just makes life hard and difficult. And this morning, I want us to look at Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verses 9 through 20. And I want us to see three things. Three things that are absolutely essential to building a fire and cultivating a fire in our souls that will sustain us and will keep us on track, even though we live in the reality that life is hard. So if you will, look with me in Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Three things we're going to look at this morning. There's a word that we need to hear. There's a vision, that, something that we need to see. And then there's another word that we need to hear. In verse 9, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. It's piercing saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Theatera and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see, I love that, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have, hear this, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Three things I want us to see this morning to fuel a fire in our souls. The first one is a word of encouragement. Look where it begins. You know, over the past few months, 
I have just been overwhelmed with this idea of encouragement. It's like every time I open my Bible and read through, I, I see the words encouragement over and over and over again. Paul is always teaching encouragement. He's always going back to the churches where there he has been involved in, and he is going back to encourage them. It's encouragement over and over and over, and I keep seeing this, and I keep seeing it in, in my role as a pastor. I'm thinking, how encouraging am I? And I just keep hearing this theme over and over. And then we come to this passage this morning. And in this passage, I find it one of the most, you know, some people look at the book of Revelation and they think it's all this doom and gloom and this thing to instill fear. The book of Revelation is the most encouraging, hopeful book of the Bible. It's an encouragement, and it's written to instill a hope. And frankly, I find this passage to be one of the most encouraging parts of the book. Look, look in the passage that we just read in verses 9 through 11, and then down in verses 12 through 13. When John looks to see the voice, and it's interesting the way we get these juxtapositions of hearing and seeing. When he looks to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw, what, seven golden lampstands, and we find out later in the passage that the lampstands represent the churches where, that John has, has pastored, that he's kind of the circuit pastor of. And in the midst of the churches, and these are struggling churches, these are churches, these are, are Christians, these are followers of Jesus who are in a season of life where it is not easy to be a follower of Jesus. Rome has kind of made it difficult. They're in one of their moods, whether this, this is taking place in the 60s, AD 60s, or the AD 90s. There's opinions that go, it doesn't really matter. There are times in Rome's history, when they begin to clamp down on Christians and say, no, 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 radical group we need to. And so John finds himself on a prison island, and the churches are struggling as well. But notice what he sees. I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. And we realize as this unfolds that this son of man, the title that Jesus took up for himself throughout his ministry, it is Jesus. Notice where is Jesus as these churches struggle to live out their faith in a culture that is not being very tolerant of them at the moment. Where is Jesus? Where is he? In the midst. Jesus is in the midst. He is with them. I find this incredibly, incredibly encouraging that as they are struggling to hold on to their faith, as they are struggling, as we're going to read in chapters 2 and 3, some of them, to live out their faith with integrity. As they're struggling with all of this, Jesus, God in the flesh, is in their midst. He is with them. With them. And not only that, but if you look at the beginning of the passage, I, John, how does John describe himself? Your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John is there because of his faith. He's been exiled. He's been banished. He's not allowed to see his churches. And yet, notice what he says. He, he's not a leader who is aloof. He's not a leader who is uh, standing on the outside looking in. But he's a shepherd who is in the midst. And in fact, he says, I, I am with you. I am walking with you. Why? Because I, I'm going through the exact same stuff that you are. He identifies with his people. As they struggle to live out their faith, 
He is struggling as well. And yet, in the midst, he's encouraging them. You know, interestingly, studies have have borne out and proven for years that geography, that place, and light affect things like addiction, affect things like suicide, affect things like depression. Where there is low light, where there is low connection to people, we have this tendency toward, where, where there is isolation, we have this tendency toward depression, suicide, and dependency upon all kinds of things that we fall into as we disperse and go our own ways. There is warmth and comfort in knowing that there are others on the journey with us. When we begin to think that we are on the journey and we are the only ones on the journey and nobody really knows where we are, nobody really understands what I'm going through, there's nobody walking with me, where we end up is not good. Where we end up is not good. But John gives, and God through John, gives a word of encouragement. I am with you. I am in the midst. And John even says, I'm with you too. You are not alone. I am one of you. I am with you. Don't walk alone. You will not fulfill what God created you to be and do on your own. This Jesus and me Christianity that we've cultivated in the Western world and especially in the United States is not the way of God. You cannot and will not do it on its own. You will never get one big log started on fire by itself. But you put a whole bunch of kindling together and some light combustible stuff together and you can get a fire going. And eventually that fire gets hot enough that bigger, thicker, heavier stuff will combust and burn as well. But it takes a group, not an individual. So be encouraged. Wherever you are, Right now, whatever it is, maybe you're going through, whatever it is you're struggling with, maybe you're having a hard time really seeing and grasping what God is up to. Hear this word of encouragement. He's in the midst. And one of the ways that he's in the midst is as his people walk together as representatives of his presence in the midst. You know, it's hard to believe that God is in the midst when we have no voice telling us, reminding us, or embodying his presence to us. We absolutely need one another. Please hear that word of encouragement. Secondly, John begins hearing And he looks to see what he hears. Number two, the second thing that I want us to get this morning, the second thing that kind of stokes the fire and builds the fire in us is a vision of Jesus. In the midst of the stuff of life, it is so easy to lose perspective. I mean, sometimes all we can see is the to-do list that we've got in front of us. Sometimes all we can see is, this is what I've got to get accomplished today, or this is what I know, we've got this, the the rest of this week, and sometimes that's all we can see. Sometimes our mentality kind of gets down to, I've just got to survive this week. If I can just get these things done, if I can just get past this test, yes. If I can just survive this week and accomplish these few things, if I can just get my kids to this and this and this, and get, if I can just get through, I'm good. But sometimes 
That becomes the all-consuming thought of our lives. And all we can see is what is right in front of us. Every now and then, we need an aerial view. Every now and then, we need a picture that, that zooms us out and lifts us above and lets us see what is bigger than and better than and beyond what our limited perspective allows us to see. We need a perspective that is not so obscured by the tyranny of the urgent. We need a perspective that's the aerial flyover view. You know, it's interesting that John turns to see the voice that he hears, and I want us to look for a few minutes at exactly what he sees. He sees one like a son of man. It's a man and yet different. And this comes from Daniel chapter 7 and 10 and chapter 2, where there's this vision of a son of man. And this one, though, is different. He's a little bit different. But he sees one like a son of man. Looks like a man, and yet there's just something different. Then he sees that, that this one like a son of man is wearing a long robe with a golden sash. These are Aaron's priestly garments. The long robe with the golden sash. This one is, is a priest. This son of man that he sees is a priest. He has white hair, which represents wisdom. In the ancient world, the old, <laughs> those of us, when I've got hair, if I let it grow out, it would be whitish. Doesn't mean I should automatically be respectful with wisdom, but in the ancient world, if you had white hair, you were respected as one who knew. You had wisdom. You had lived. The white hair represents wisdom and respect. He has eyes of fire. There's a penetrating scrutiny. He sees and knows. He sees the reality. He sees the truth. He sees with a perspective maybe we don't always have. He's got bronze feet. In the image of Daniel chapter 2, this grand vision and this, this image that he sees has a base, a pedestal, that is an iron mixed with clay. And in the end, in the vision, because iron and clay do not mix very well, the clay crumbles and the entire image falls and crumbles because its foundation was weak. The image itself that was upheld by the pedestal was grand, it was beautiful, it was made of ornate stuff, but it fell because its foundation crumbled. But the feet of bronze are both malleable and soft, and yet they have stability and strength. And so this one, this vision, this son of man does not topple and fall, but he stands, and he cannot fall. He has a voice like rushing waters. You ever been near a heavy flowing stream? You ever been near a waterfall when it's really gushing? It's almost deafening. It's so loud. If you've ever been on a mountain stream with the water running high in the spring, it can be so loud that you can be 20 feet away from somebody, and you can't hear. You have to scream. You have to yell to be heard because rushing water just drowns out everything else. And when John looks at this son of man, he said his, his voice just drowns out what he has to say. His perspective, his word drowns out all else. All other words all other voices, all the other opinions that are out there are drowned out by this Son of Man. He's holding seven stars in his right hand. 
And the right hand is the place where you hold with power and strength. There's security. There's nearness. There's closeness. There's an intimacy. He's holding them in his right hand. He's not far off. He's not far removed. He's not distant. He has them in his right hand. He has a sharp, double-edged sword for a mouth. His words of truth cut both ways. He can speak one word and it can be received with grace and mercy or it can be a word of condemnation and justice. It all depends on how that word is heard because truth cuts both ways. Truth cuts both ways depending on if you really want to hear it or not. But from his mouth come a double-edged sword that is sharp. His face is bright as the sun. Remember when Moses would come down from the mountain, being in the presence of God, his face radiated, it glowed. They put a veil over his face because the people didn't want to see it. It was, it was too much. It's the glory of the presence of God. And the glory of the presence of God is all about this Son of Man. You remember the Aaronic blessing, Aaron's blessing, number 625. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And this is the blessing when he sees the Son of Man with this face. It's like the radiance and the glory of God. His face is shining upon you. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that cool to know that the radiance, the presence, the glory of God is shining on you right now? As you sit where you are right now, God's radiant, glorious face is shining and looking upon you. John gets a vision of Jesus. You know, it's so easy to lose our perspective when we lose sight of Jesus. Remember when Peter was walking on the water and he took his eyes off Jesus? What did he do? He sank. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now this is not vision that we mean by you know, a person who has a leadership vision, a plan for where we ought to. This means a prophetic vision. Where there is no prophetic vision, where there is no word from God, when there is no in the immediate present, God is speaking. People kind of perish and wither and shrivel up and die. Why? Because we need to hear from God. Why? Because we were created by God. We were created for God. We are created to be fueled by a relationship with God. And when God is not speaking, we grow cold. We grow hard, we shrivel up, we shrink, and we die. When we fail to see what God is up to, see, that's what a prophetic vision does. When you read the prophets in the Old Testament, the vision that the prophet delivers kind of gives the people a clue as to what God is doing in their midst. Because we lose sight of that, frankly. We get caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff and we lose sight of what God is or wants to be doing or is going to do in our midst. And as we lose sight of that, we perish. When we fail to see what God is up to, when we fail to hear Him speaking to us, or when we fail to listen, we will grow cold and discouraged. There is no other way about it. We cannot live disconnected from the one who created us. We need to hear from him. But our vision must be clear and full. Let me ask you this. Which perspective is better? The perspective from being on the ground in the trenches, in the stuff of life, or the perspective of the aerial view where you get to zoom out and kind of see the big picture of what's really going on. Which one is better? Not a rhetorical question. We've got aerial view, 
Anybody want to argue, disagree? Let's, let's have an argument. No. <laughs> the answer is what? both. It's both. God possesses both perspectives. Jesus is both in the midst, and yet he sees the big picture. John sees the big picture, and yet he says, I am with you, and I am in the midst. I want to read a passage from Eugene Peterson's book called Reversed Thunder, which is an awesome little book on the book of Revelation. And this is what he writes. It is difficult to recapture by an act of imagination. Now listen to this. The incongruity of a person self-designated as the Son of Man, hanging pierced and bleeding on a cross. The incongruity is less dramatic, but even more offensive, when this Son of Man has dinner with a prostitute, stops off for lunch with a tax collector, wastes time blessing children when there were Roman legions to be chased from the land, heals unimportant losers and ignores high-achieving Pharisees and influential Sadducees. Jesus juxtaposed the most glorious title available to him. The Son of Man is the title of glory in Daniel's vision that John recaptures here. Jesus juxtaposed the most glorious title available to him with the most menial of lifestyles in the culture. He talked like a king and acted like a slave. He preached with high authority and lived like a vagabond. Jesus was systematic in this double affirmation. He was, in fact, son of man, given dominion and glory and kingdom. He was, in fact, completely at home in the ordinary, the everyday, the common. He did not give an inch in either direction. He was very God, very man. And that's the vision that John presents us with here of Jesus. If you want to sustain a fuel of fire in your soul, we need a clear, full picture of Jesus. And thirdly, thirdly, the passage ends with another word. He hears and then he sees And now he hears again in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen. Those that are and those that are to take place after this. And then he gives him a little bit more information. There's not a much more worse way to live than with a sense or with a feeling that things are never going to be any better than this. There is nothing worse than living in a life of hopelessness. Notice John's response when he sees this vision of the Son of Man. He falls at his feet, though dead. And then Jesus says, this always cracks me up. He gets a vision of God. He falls at the feet of God. Jesus puts his hand on his head. Don't be afraid. Okay, yeah, right. I'm standing in the presence of God. I'm talking face to face with God. And I'm supposed to just be okay with this? Are you kidding me? The word is always, though, don't be afraid. What do you mean, don't be afraid? I'm talking to God. I'm standing in the face of God. I've got every reason to be afraid. No big deal. I'm just face to face with God. Now listen to what Jesus says, though. When John falls at his feet and Jesus places his hand on his head, he says, I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one who died but was raised to life forevermore. You hear the gospel in this whole story? This is the gospel. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Translation of all of this. I see and know what you're going through. I know where you are. 
I know how difficult it is to live in this countercultural Jesus way that doesn't go along with the people that you live with. I know. I get it. I see it. Why? Because I was there. I did it too. Jesus says, I did it too. But he says, you know what? I've got this. I've got this. Not only do I have this, but I've got you. I've got you. This message of hope, though, is not merely for John. He says, I've got this and I've got you. Now you need to send this message to the seven churches because they need to hear it too. Hope is not just something that you hold on to for yourselves, but hope is something that is always to be given away as well. This word of hope is not just for us, it's for others. A life of encouragement and hope leads to a life of purpose. The, per the perspective transcends our perspective. So I don't know where you are this morning. Don't know what's going on in your life. But I want you to know and hear these words. The word of encouragement. I want you to see a vision, a glimpse of Jesus. And hear these words of hope. He is in your midst. He sees, he knows, and he says, I hold the keys. Death, Hades, everything that threatens you, everything that you're afraid of, I've got the keys to it all. I've overcome. I am the living one. I am with you. Hear those words. Know this truth, and you will be okay. Because I am with you, and you will be with me, and I will see you through to the very end. Let's pray together. God, all we can do is say thank you. Wow. Wow. You are first and last. You hold the keys. You are the authority. You are the secure foundation. You are the high priest. You are the one that makes a way between us and our Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord. We hold on to you. God, let that fuel our souls. Let these truths and this vision of who you are Give us fuel to live on. Give us direction and purpose to live out. Father, give us strength as we experience your presence. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.